he left. He's not going to force himself on to people. So Jesus and his disciples and anybody else who was with him got back in the boats and they made just, at, and we talked last week about how fierce a storm they went through, a six mile boat ride, they're tired. As is the ministry. When we step up to serve, we don't really know what's in front of us. When we say, Lord, your will be done, a lot of people try not to say that prayer because we don't know what that means. So now they're getting ready for another six, seven-mile boat ride back to the other side, and that's where we're going to pick up in verse 21. Now when they had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. So as soon as they cross back over to the other side, more work is waiting for them on the other side. The premise of what we're really going to be going into this morning is found in verse 31. And a difference between thronging about Jesus and touching. The difference of thronging and touching. Guzik breaks down a little bit further. He this he has that contrast of casual contact versus reaching out in faith and what the two look like. So Jesus lands on the other side and you just imagine kind of the scene. As we have seen so far, as we saw, um, I guess, wow, two years ago now, as we went through the book of Luke, we have all of these multitudes that were showing up to be fed, they were showing up to witness miracles or to be a part of miracles. We see a great, just a thronging of them there for his teachings. And we see the busyness of the disciples, not just the 12, but the rest that are also kind of being raised up in the group. What we're going to see in the rest of chapter 5 are two individuals that are not just there to be around Jesus. They're not just there for the casual contact with Jesus. They are there. Um, that word to, to touch, as we'll see, when she wants to touch Jesus' cloak, what she wants to do is lay hold and seize it and not let go, is that word that's kind of given to us in the Greek. She wants, and we're going to see another, that these two individuals are not just there to be around or to kind of hear it as, as ambiance or to be a part of the buzz. They are there with the intention to reach out in faith. Verse 22, And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. This is kind of a big deal, isn't it? A ruler of the synagogue. The man was probably a Pharisee. That would have been really hard for the Pharisee. If he was just simply a ruler of the synagogue, what does that mean? Really what it is is uh, what we would call a pastor now. That's really what we're dealing with. He was, the, he was the guy that made sure that the worship in the synagogue was going the way it was supposed to be, that all the services were going the way it was supposed to be, responsible for the teachings or making sure that someone was there to speak on the word. What is his relationship to Christ? We don't know. But what we do know is Jesus has already been doing a little bit of work in his area, don't we? When Jesus steps on the scene... We see a demon-possessed man, probably in this guy's synagogue, being dealt with. We see healings in his streets not far from where his synagogue was. We already saw, a few chapters ago, a whole handful of scribes or Pharisees show up to try and refute and interdict what it is that Jesus is doing. Within the last week, it's very possible that this guy was contending with Christ, with the rest of his buddies in their fancy garb. That's what we have as far as dark context. What a hard place to be for this individual. It's interesting. The question often arises, well, we have a good God and I'm a good person. So why do we have hard stuff? It's interesting how the circumstance changes we have something as dramatic as this in our lives. 
It causes us to refocus, causes us to have a, a whole different look, especially at who Jesus is. This man is probably not entirely sure, and we'll get into that, exactly who Christ is, but he is really starting to figure out what it is that Jesus can do. I really like that for the aspect of our testimonies. I don't even, and a great deal of scholars, disciples, commentators, teachers, don't have everything memorized cover to cover. They don't have answers for everything, but like we discussed last week, you don't need to have the answers for everything. Just need a piece. It's a seed being planted. They're not putting a pine tree in the ground right out the gate. So we see this man coming and begging Jesus earnestly. Clark points out that what we see demonstrated from this um, ruler of the synagogue for essential aspects to prayer. We see that he humbles himself. We see that he lays open his request earnestly. We see that he has confidence in the power and in the goodness of Christ. But one of the biggest things is kind of step one, isn't it? What did this ruler of the synagogue do? First, he put himself into the presence of Christ. Something that a week ago he probably did not see himself doing. So he comes before Christ, and we have to really kind of put our, our, ourselves in his shoes, if able. The rulers of the synagogue, or Pharisees, or scribes, they dress just a little bit differently than everybody else. Dress a little bit fancier. Nicer clothes, nicer robes. And he comes in front of everybody. We don't have the secret request here. These are multitudes. He's coming in, he's dressed differently, he's making a beeline to Christ, we're going to see all these people kind of thronging about him. That makes sense. If we want to get to the point, this morning, my goodness, <laughs> we need more pathways. This morning was rough. We had a whole bunch of people, you know, apparently the coffee, whoever did the coffee this morning, good job, it was right popular because everybody was thronging the coffee pots and we're trying to push and shove and we're giving people the Heisman, trying to get to where we need to go. It's hard and it's easy to sneak by. I consistently have to, oh, hey, good morning, as people are past me, because it's just hard to kind of spot people. It's hard, to, it's hard to get around a little bit. Not for the Pharisee. What they want, they get. So when they step onto the scene, what's everybody else do? They start parting. Just like the Red Sea, he's making a beeline for Christ. Get out of my way, they get out of his way. What's the issue with that picture? They can all see him. They see him in his weakness. They see him in his desperation. They see him throw himself before Christ. Laying aside humility, laying aside your pride, taking that humble stance in the presence of Christ is one of the hardest things sometimes, isn't it? Why do we have such hard situations in our lives? God has a purpose in it. And here we see the humility of the synagogue ruler, and he asks Jesus to go. And I, man, I love the response. I love the heart of Christ. One of the reasons I love teaching through the gospel so much because we get such an insight into who he is and an insight into who we are. I like what Jesus did, and I like what he did not do. Oh, now you want something. A week ago, you were chasing me around, saying that I was casting out demons Casting out Satan by the power of Satan. That was, now you want me to, to, to bring the, that power into your house. We don't see him doing that. Even though that some of our, even if it's not our first words, it's certainly our first thought. Oh, what a dirtbag. Now you want something. I have half a mind to tell you no. So Jesus went with him. And a great multitude followed him and thronged him. This is such a game changer. For disciples, we've been there. We have friends, family, co-workers, or you know, we just watching stuff on the media or whatever else. There's those certain people, as soon as they start walking your way, it's like, oh, I can feel the sting in my heart. I'm going to have to deal with them again. 
it's important to kind of take ourselves and put ourselves in the position of the disciples at this point. Oh, here, that's that same dirtbag. That's that same guy that was fighting with us a week ago. Now he's back. Great. First a demoniac, then we get run out of Gadara, then we had to paddle across the Galilean Sea for six miles. Now that guy again. And he comes and he throws himself at the feet of Jesus. That would have been kind of a shocker for them. Ah, oh, can't judge a book by its cover. And Jesus agrees to go and help him. Can you imagine what that would have done for the disciples? Someone you would not think that would ask for Christ's help and to serve and to minister is now asking for it. And it's not just, you know, oh, it's not just Bob. It's the ruler of the synagogue. Guys, we're really going to do this. Oh, this is, this is us. We're on the up and up. Now we're helping these guys. Can you imagine how excited they would have been? One, they're tethered with Christ. But now what they're doing as far as the ministry is tethered to the synagogue ruler. They're trying to force their way through people, thronging, but not right now because they're with the synagogue ruler. The masses have parted. We're just going to, a beeline. We've kind of been there in a parade or whatever. You're walking next to somebody else's important. Maybe you're the important one. You just kind of, you've got that strut about you <laughs> as you're going through. That's what they're doing. They are on a mission. We get that way especially those of us that are more military mindset. If I have a mission, I have a purpose, I have something I got to do, do not break my stride. If you break my stride, you break my plan, you break my process, you will rue the day. That's the mentality we get. <laughs> Chuck Smith, a number of years ago, decided that he was going to write his own Proverbs. I think he wrote two. I don't even know the second one. But the one that always stuck in my head is blessed are the flexible because they will never be broken. He enjoyed saying that one. If you are that stiff and that stern, as soon as something happens that's outside of your wheelhouse, what happens? I like to consider myself a very patient man. I like to think that I am fluid. I like to think that I am flexible. You want to see me pout and turn into a baby? Interrupt my plans. <laughs> Kyle's laughing. He's the same way, so I don't know what you're laughing about. <laughs> so they're on a mission. We are going to go. This is a desperate situation. For those of us that are parents, we understand just how desperate a situation it is. His little girl is dying. Man. So they're going to go do something big with Jesus, with somebody else that's kind of big for someone so little. So Jesus went with him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Before we really start getting into uh, this other desperate individual, you should never under, um, underrate your work. Sharing the gospel or offering to pray with somebody always seems so trivial. Not necessarily to us, because we do, or should, understand the power of prayer. It should never be that. Well, the least I could do for you. All through these pages, prayers have knocked down cities. <laughs> Prayers have decimated armies. We understand how powerful prayer is. We understand what it does. But often when we're sharing, it's like, well, all I could really do is just tell them Jesus loves them. Man, that's a lot. She'd heard about Jesus, and now she's cutting that beeline to Jesus. Never underestimate the power of just giving even the simplest, smallest prayer or piece of the gospel. So we have desperate individual number two, the woman with the flow of blood for 12 years. It's easy to kind of, okay, she has a sickness and she's been going to a bunch of doctors. Well, what do doctors do? Well, not, let me back up. It's not what doctors do. We know what doctors do. They're supposed to be healing people. Um, what do people in the bill paying department do? <laughs> Man, that stuff's expensive. <laughs> Really expensive. I've never paid attention to how, much, how expensive it is because I've never had to worry about it. When I was a kid, I was a kid. Kids don't worry. You know, you're going to jump out of a tree onto a running horse. You're going to go ahead and do that because the parents have everything. 
And I spent 12 years in the military. You don't, you don't pay for hospital bills in the military, so you can still go do whatever you want. After my f second hip surgery, they messed up the billing, and they decided just to bill me just for the anesthesia. Oh, my goodness. I would have had to sell a car just, just to pay for the anesthesia. This stuff's expensive. 12 years of it. Some of us have been there. Prolonged injuries or illnesses. You know exactly what this can do. It's like, well, yeah, it's a hardship. And it's just a, a flow of blood. It's not that bad. You have to understand, for her, by their laws and the way that they pushed the laws, this would have rendered, rendered her ceremonially and socially unclean. What does that mean? If she touched anyone or anything, it rendered that unclean. So in Leviticus uh, 15, starting verse 19, this is where we find it. If a woman has a discharge, and the discharge from her body is blood, she shall be set apart seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. Everything that she lies on during her impurity shall be unclean. Also, everything that she sits on shall be unclean. Whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Whoever touches anything that she sat on shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. If anything is on her bed or on anything on which she sits, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until evening. And if any man lies with her at all, so that her impurity is on him, he shall be unclean seven days, and every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, other than the time of her customary impurity, or if it runs beyond her usual time of impurity, all the days of her unclean discharge shall be as the, seven, or as the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge shall be to her as the bed of her impurity. And whatever she sits on shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her impurity. Whoever touches those things shall be unclean. He shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. But if she is cleansed of her discharge, then she shall count for herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day she shall take for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the priest shall offer the one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for the discharge of her uncleanness. For 12 years, not allowed to synagogue, not allowed to be around friends not allowed to be around family because anything she touches or anyone she touches, they also cannot partake in those things. She would have fallen into the same category as the lepers. Whenever they got within a certain range of anyone, they had to yell out, unclean. They were not allowed to be around other people. 12 years. Now we see her level of desperation. And she had just heard about Jesus. How much has Jesus done at this point? We're a little over a year into his ministry. So she has heard these things have been happening in all of these regions as she has decided to seek Jesus. Everything she had, she'd given to doctors. Trying for healing, and all it did was make it worse. So when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. So she is the second one we see that isn't interested in casual contact. But she is deciding to reach out in faith. But she's doing it differently than the ruler of the synagogue. He came in threw himself at the feet of Jesus and asked. She's doing Operation Sneaky Squirrel and she's trying to wiggle her way through the masses just so she can touch him. And she does. Verse 29, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Her faith activated the healing she reaches out through the crowd and you just kind of see and i kind of like how it's always depicted in some of the films and the shows and you see her kind of like reaching between the legs of people just anything she can just as a passing by trying to get the hem 
of his garment. And for those of you who can run it down to the book of Numbers, you can see the tassels and what they represent at the hem of the garments of the men and their relationship to Christ. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, <laughs> I love the disciples. There's a bunch of us just in the pages of the Bible. So Jesus gets touched and he feels like he knows that power goes out of him. That's awesome. And we'll get into that. So he, he, he knows, he turns around. You have to remember the people, they're just everywhere. They are thronging all about him. He stops and wheels around and asks, who touched me? Not just who touched me. We know touch, right? Like we know when someone taps on the shoulder or whatever. But your clothes, people don't always feel that. He wheels around, who touched my clothes? Not just clothes. Like people you can feel, I like to think you can, but you know, somebody trying to steal your wallet. Like, they like you feel your pant kind of tug a little bit. Or you can feel like, you know, my one-year-old pulling on my pants. You can feel somebody kind of touching your clothes. But the tassels of a, like a robe, the smallest things even don't get past Jesus. So he wheels around and he asks the question, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? <laughs> That's us. So let's back it up. Jesus, this is one of my favorite studies. I know I say it a lot. And as long as there's questions in the Bible, I'm going to keep saying it. Jesus asks a question. Why does Jesus ask the question? Well, that's obvious, Pastor, because he doesn't know the answer. That's stupid. And blasphemy. Verse 32, and he looked around to see her who had done this thing. He knows it's her. He knows exactly who it was in the crowd, in this multitude. He knows exactly who touched him. He knows exactly where that power went. He knows exactly where faith was activated. Why did Jesus ask the question? And I really love this chapter. I know I say that a lot. Again, you're just going to keep hearing that too. I love the rest of this chapter because it actually answers the question. A lot of times we have these questions. We really got to get into the text to try and figure out, okay, it's not that God is bad at hide and seek. This is why he asked the question of Adam and why he was hiding in the bushes. Why does Jesus ask this question? Who touched me? It's for the benefit of three people. It's for the benefit of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. It's for the benefit of the woman that was healed. And you have to remember in context where we are in the word. He's still training up his disciples. It is for the benefit of the disciples that he asks this question. First, we'll deal with Jairus. How would it be to his benefit? I think point number one, it's to stretch his faith. When you are desperate, especially the desperation when you are a parent and you have a sick kid or a hurt kid, just any level of desperation, what happens to time? It just stops, doesn't it? Every moment seems to be stretched into a thousand frames. Everything for you slows down. But not for the men on a mission. The world keeps on turning. It's only slow for us. They're on a mission. Jairus, his faith looks a lot different than a similar story that we see in Luke chapter 7 with the Roman centurion. We remember that story, right, as we went through the book of Luke. Centurion says, no, no, no. You just speak. You don't have to come into my house. I really like that. To Roman centurion, Jesus says, no, no other faith in all of Israel. No one has the same kind of faith you do. Man, that would have hurt the rest of the Jews standing around Jesus. But anyway, the Roman centurion says, no, you don't even need to come into my house. I have servants. I know how this, I know. You just speak the word and they'll be made well. Jairus still probably has a little bit of cultural superstition mixed into what he is trying to do. Jesus has to come to his house has to lay his hands on the child. Why? Because that's what we read in the rest of the Old Testament. Remember the child that lay sick in the attic, dead in the attic. And the prophet prostrated himself over the child, laid over the child, put his hands out, and the child was made well. Jesus has to come to the house. So the Lord is stretching his faith a little bit. 
two, point number two for Jairus. To encourage him. It's very possible that the ruler of the synagogue, this is his kind of his last ditch effort. Can Jesus actually do this? Sure, I've heard about him healing other people. Sure, I probably saw him. I'm saying probably because it doesn't give us all of the text, but he probably saw Jesus cast out a demoniac. He's like, well, Jewish guys, they can cast out demons too. I don't know if he can heal or not. But Jesus is intentionally calling out that woman that was healed to strengthen the faith of Jairus. And the benefit of the woman. We'll get to the benefit of the disciples here in a minute. There's a lot in this text, so you'll have to excuse me as I try and organize my thoughts. So Jesus asks, who touched me? His disciples say, how can you ask who touched you? The disciples cannot discern who and distinguish whom, but God always can. So to the benefit of the woman... First, we see the concept of open confession. She gets to openly confess Christ. Why does that matter? Two reasons. First, when a miracle or something takes place in our life, what creeps in shortly after? Doubt. Was I actually healed? Was it actually him? And our flesh or the enemy really starts to kind of twist those thoughts. Two, Everybody knows she's unclean. Twelve years as something of a social pariah, people start to figure it out. Oh, yeah, that's Steve. Man, that guy's such a hermit. He only comes down from the mountains once every few years for beans or whatever. Like, people know, especially in small areas, we know. We figure everybody out. We know where people live. We know what people are doing. We know what people's hobbies are. Like, we just know. Like, we know stuff as distant neighbors that we probably shouldn't. I, I know stuff about my neighbors that I don't even know about my best friend. He's making sure that everybody else understands that she is clean. Also a lesson for the disciples. Why is she sneaking around? She's not supposed to be there. She's unclean. By their laws, we're going to say thronging and we say multitudes. How many people is that one? It doesn't actually say. Let's just go with a rounded number and call it a thousand. Jesus is trying to make his way from the beach to Jairus' house. People are thronging. How many people did she touch on her way to? That'd be a lot of really angry people. We're at a great season for that, aren't we? <laughs> we get it. Being in crowded spaces, we've got masks and vaccinations and people coughing on everybody else or whatever else. All those videos that people have been doing. Five years ago, it was funny. Somebody would sneeze or pretend they were sneezing, but they'd spray the back of the person's neck with a squirt bottle. Not nice, but kind of funny. Other people tried doing those videos here in the last year. Nobody thinks it's funny anymore. A lot of people got beat up. People are less apt to touch other people as a part of what we used to do. At the end of our announcements, we would stand up and we would greet one another. Shake hands, hugs, whatever. We don't do it anymore. Some of that social aspect has kind of lost its salt in everything that's going on in the season. How many people did she touch on her way to Jesus? If anybody else in that crowd had actually recognized her and who she was, how many people were rendered unclean and couldn't participate in any of the Sabbath meals or go to synagogue? Once they were rendered unclean, they would have had to essentially put their hands in the air, I'm unclean. And they'd have had to try and make, as people parted, just like they did for the religious leader, as people parted from them, she'd have to hold her hand in the air and walk out of the crowd. She's now unclean. She reached out and touched a rabbi. Man, talk about doing something dumb in public that renders you like, oh, I'm that that guy or girl. 
She touched a rabbi and would have made him unclean. She was trying to hide. Jesus is not a big fan of secret disciples. Can you imagine the faces on the disciples? One, they've been stopped in their mission. We already don't like that. They just touched their master. Now he's, how is he possibly going to minister now? Thank you, random lady in the crowd. Now he's unclean. Now how is he supposed to go heal his little girl? Now he has to go and get purified and go through all the ritual. And you can just, religion just does that, doesn't it? Very rigid, immovable, inflexible. Can you imagine the look on the face of Jairus? Why are we stopping? Yes, she's sick. My kid is dying. So you can see just how much would be packed into this situation. So disciples ask, how can you ask who touched you? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling Makes sense that she's fearing and trembling as we just discussed. She's unclean, in a crowd, unidentified, touching people, and touching Jesus. Love the heart of Jesus. He does not rebuke her. One of the biggest things for us that we could learn as disciples in Christ, it's not your time anymore. Greater love hath no man than this, than he who lays down his life for his friends. We take that out of context a lot, don't we? Where we add overemphasis to one side. You know where I generally see that verse? It's attached to some kind of military poster. Or an EMT poster. Or a firefighter poster. That's where we attach, oh, they're laying down their lives for their friends. But we let slip the aspect to set aside our things for somebody else's thing because they are breaking our stride we don't see christ rebuking her we can kind of feel what's coming from the disciples oh how dare you you have interrupted we have already agreed to help this man and now not only is jesus wasting his time playing where's waldo spinning in a crowd trying to figure out who touched the hem of his garment but now he's got a deal with you and you're not even supposed to be here we can see the stiffness in the situation so she was afraid, she was trembling because she was outed. Nobody likes being put on public display, generally, unless you're a big fan of everything that you've got going on. Nobody likes being singled out. That's why it's always awkward when someone's getting yelled at at like a Walmart because you see the guy just standing there and everybody else is looking into the situation. So knowing what had happened to her, she came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Man, what a powerful lesson, isn't it? Here we see Jesus as the, the great doctor, the great physician, and she comes down and she's throwing everything out there at Jesus, the whole truth. What does that mean? This is going to be the kind of the lesson for us. When we do come to that place and put ourselves in the presence of Christ and we really just start kind of throwing everything out there, we're essentially seeing four things identified. First of sin, suffering, methods, and hope. She's giving everything. She's pouring everything out. One of the aspects to her illness, that flow of blood, we don't need to really go into much more context than that. In that day, even now, that gets looked at as sin. Because of her lifestyle and her immoral choices, that's why this is happening. So it kind of expounds on it. But she also discusses in great detail her suffering. We don't do that because we don't want to bother the teacher. She overexpounds the concept of her methods. She tried a great deal of doctors before she got to Jesus. We typically like to skip that part. She is not. How many methods of healing do we go through before we finally take it to Christ? And then when we do finally take it to Christ, Lord, you're my only hope. I'm taking everything to you as I should, even though you're number 29 of a list of 60. I tried Dr. Phil. I tried Oprah. I tried self-help books. 
I'm not saying that chiropractors are bad. I'm not saying that Tylenol and Motrin are bad, beyond its obvious recommended dosage. I'm not a doctor. I'm not saying these things are bad. But Jesus is always our last ditch, our last hope effort. We'll try all of these other things, or, and shame on the church, we'll recommend anything else. While prayer is the least that we can do. Meanwhile, we're telling everybody to Dr. Phil or whatever else, or self-help books, or some kind of weird mantra, or whatever else it is. And she also talks about her hope. So she told him the whole truth, everything that was compacted in that. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. This is the only place where he does that. Why? For the benefit of her, so she knows exactly who she is in Christ. Man, what a blessing. When we ask often, we don't like it. It goes against the grain. It goes against pride. It makes us look bad. Whatever the case may be, it's like, oh, well, I have, I've asked too much. I've done too much. This is who I am to you now. I'm more of that pariah or that parasite, depending on how you view people. But he calls her daughter. He calls her daughter for the sake of the disciples. They were probably not thrilled. She's here. Jairus, the modern day he's here you know she has no money because she's broke she's spending all on doctors but this dude look at his robes Lord, we need money we're tired of sleeping in the dirt it's time for a hilton this guy's going to get us more publicity that's always kind of a shame why help her the point would have gone to the disciples and to jairus jesus sees her the exact same way that Jairus sees his daughter. And that would have been a powerful lesson all across the board. So he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Man, the heart of Christ. He's not annoyed. He's not annoyed to heal and he's not annoyed to stop. We stop ourselves from bringing everything, the whole truth to Christ. I don't want to talk about all my sin. I don't want to talk about all my suffering. I don't want to talk about all the other things I've tried to do. I don't want to talk about all my hope because he just doesn't have that much time. <laughs> He's the only one that does. And he still responds to her as daughter. While he was speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Jairus, there's nothing you can do. She's dead. The teacher can just go about his business. Not the news that you would want to hear. And we've seen people kind of address this with Christ. Remember the story of Lazarus and the sisters. If only you'd been here, he'd be alive. All of Jairus' world would have been coming down, so we don't know quite how he would have responded to it. We can kind of see how the disciples would respond to it. Oh, yeah, you, that's your fault. Even though we don't know how far away the ruler's house was. As soon, and this is something I have overly highlighted in my Bible, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. How amazing is that? As soon as that word went out, something that he did not want to hear, something that nobody wants to hear, as soon as that went out, you already see Jesus at work. Jesus is already at work in the situation. It's us that typically forget that. It's us that go back to other methods, other techniques, other strategies that we have learned in the past. Do not be afraid, only believe. There's a couple of ways really to look at it. Do not believe, just keep trusting in me. Do not believe the spoken word of the world, but believe in Jesus' word. He said he would go, he would go. He said he would do something, he is going to do something. 
This is important as far as vocabulary and lifestyle of the believer. Believe and fear do not coexist. They, do, they shouldn't be going into the same sentence. Fear opposes the work. There's going to be an obvious fear and a panic and a worry and a heartbreak with Jairus. It's the girl's father. Immediately, Jesus is at work in the situation. Do not, um, don't listen to what the world is pushing. Do not listen to what they, their, their news. Just, just keep believing, keep trusting in me. And so Jesus keeps going. Verse 37, he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. So we see him kind of with this other little inner, inner circle going with him to the house. And when he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, he saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. Culturally, what we're dealing with is when someone would die, they would hire professional mourners so that everybody knows how special the person was. They would show up with flutes, or tambourines, they would wail loudly, they would make this great big commotion over the situation so that everybody knows. And if you're a ruler of the synagogue, that is quite the chindig. They'd put a lot of money out there so that everybody knows exactly what's going on. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was laying. So he comes in and Jesus speaks. That word that he had promised to Jairus, everybody else knows it too, and they ridiculed him. In the Greek kind of the imperfect tense that we have in the situation, they kept doing it. It's not just us. Whenever you share their word, just be ready for ridicule. What does Jesus do? He puts them out. Why? Man, I love the why questions. Always with the whys. Why does Jesus put them out? First, probably to not discourage the faith of Jairus. And two, how much is Jesus going to have to do with those that do not believe and to contradict or to ridicule his word? There's a spiritual lesson in that for us. We really like to hang on to distractions. Really think about it. How much stuff do you have in your life right now that keep you from studying, reading, participating in fellowship properly or that distract us from the word? How much? It's Jesus. He's just not going to listen to the babblings of hirelings. So he puts them outside. He puts the ones outside that are a distraction. He keeps in his circle his people that he is raising up and people that he is ministering to. Solid focus. So he took the parents in and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. Love the contrast between the woman with the flow of blood for 12 years and the 12-year-old girl that he was raising up. Such a powerful thing, isn't it? We as disciples, read situations differently than God does. That's why it's important to abide in Him and to be filled and led by the Spirit. How would we have assessed the situation? We, in the military, EMT, whatever kind of backgrounds, we have this fancy little thing we call triage. He's less hurt than that guy. So this guy gets first pick. Jesus assesses situations differently but he commanded them strictly that no one should know it a point that we will continue to get into as we move through the gospel his time for that recognition has not yet come how do we know that timetable um, for those of you that are students a great place to start is in daniel chapter 9 in the triumphal entry 
and said that something should be given her to eat. That's awesome. He'd raise the little girl up. He'd kicked all of the mourners outside. The little girl's walking around. He tells them, hey, you need to give her something to eat. Why? Because <laughs> it's practical. She's probably not doing real well, and she's in need of a sandwich. We would call that follow-up work. Sometimes we're called to that place of follow-up work. Two, there's quite the superstition of, well, she's a ghost. doesn't really count. Anybody seen Casper, the original one, the movie? What happened? They're all sitting at the table, they're eating. Right to the ground. Ghosts can't eat, apparently. Jesus has that follow-up work. There is a difference, and we don't really have a lot of time. If you are lukewarm, or you are fence-sitting, or you're just here because either your spouse made you, or your parents made you feel bad about yourself, you're not really sure what's going on, or you assume that a casual contact, a casual encounter with Christ is just everything you need, you are wrong. We are called into a much deeper and just a better relationship with Christ. There's a difference between a casual contact and a reaching out in faith. We'll say out of the thousand people that were thronging about Christ, Two of them, those aren't good odds. Two of them were there reaching out in faith. We have that time now. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And we're very thankful, God, for the contents therein. Especially this morning. Lord, you have shown us just how important we are to you. In this text, God, you are tired. You're sore. You had just finished up with a multitude that didn't want anything to do with you. Followed by a current multitude, Lord, that didn't want a whole lot to really do with you either. And through that period where things were just heavy and just hard, Lord, you strengthened the faith of one, healed two daughters, while continuing to raise up your disciples because we just mean that much to you. We're very thankful for your heart, and we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you for blessing our morning. We pray in your holy name. Amen.